one o'clock. CBS News, I'm Bill Whitney. Good morning, Challenger. Day four in space for the shuttle astronauts began about half an hour ago with a gentle wake-up from mission control. NASA hopes to reverse the trend of the past three days with a successful deployment of Indonesia's Palapa communication satellite. It's been delayed because of doubt about the fate of Western Union satellite, Westar 6. It's been found in one piece, but at such a low orbit that its usefulness is severely limited. Sunday, when the astronauts tried to practice rendezvous maneuvers with a target balloon, the balloon burst. More news in a minute. Lebanon leads toward chaos as a curfew is clamped on Beirut. Pressure builds under Mount St. Helens. Another eruption is now expected. Good morning, this is Reed Collins with the CBS World News Roundup. It's a reasonable risk, so says a NASA spokesman about the planned deployment today of an Indonesian communications satellite from the payload bay of the orbiting Challenger. This satellite, named Palapa B, is just about identical to Westar 6, the package that was delivered to the wrong address, a uselessly low orbit. Challenger's astronauts report the last they saw of West Star, it was stable as a rock, spinning as it was supposed to, into the darkness. Today, the crew will take a closer look. The astronauts will use a television camera on the remote manipulator arm to try and observe the firing of the satellite's boost motor, which will occur approximately 45 minutes after the deployment. They'll be slightly above and back about six to eight miles from the satellite as it fires the boost motor. NASA technical advisor Jim Mizell. There is anxiety about this delayed deployment of the Indonesian satellite. It's using the same kind of kick motor made by Firecom that might have failed for Vistar. And the propellant is from the very same batch that fueled the failed satellite. To quote a NASA spokesman, this is a roll of the dice. Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. CBS News, this is Doug Poling. Budget Blue. The space shuttle Challenger this morning deployed an Indonesian communications satellite. So far, this one is all right. This is Jay Jones at the Kennedy Space Center. Astronaut Robert Stewart reports Challenger delivered Palapa as scheduled. The deploy was absolutely nominal, on time. That was less than an hour ago when springs in Challenger's payload bay propelled a spinning Indonesian communications satellite into space. The shuttle then fired its own orbital maneuvering engines to separate itself from Palapa, and the astronauts extended Challenger's remote manipulator arm outside with a television camera attached to look through a zoom lens at the deployed satellite to see if its kick motor fired as scheduled. That burn was to have occurred just a few minutes ago, and we're waiting for Challenger to report, but it's out of signal range right now. It will report through Guam in about two minutes. It may be a while before we know for sure if Palapa is heading for its proper transfer orbit and has not followed its twin, West Star 6, to oblivion. Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. on KTRH, Houston. CBS News, this is Doug Poling. Much of Beirut today deployed an Indonesian communications satellite. Its rocket engine fired successfully, avoiding the fate of Westar 2. After that, what was launched on Friday, its rocket failed, leaving the satellite useless. Under Houston, Palapa is go for deployment. The word was a long time in coming. Palapa was supposed to have sprung out of the Challenger's cargo bay two days ago. But the deployment of the Indonesian telecommunications satellite was delayed by what happened to its nearly identical twin. Whatever caused Westar's problems is still a mystery. But a representative for its owner, Western Union, thinks the blame probably lies with the satellite's booster, the engine that was supposed to kick it into a higher orbit, the same kind of engine that's attached to Palapa. Well, the government of Indonesia decided to gamble. The customer crossed its fingers, and slowly the satellite spun out of the Challenger's cargo bay. Challenger turned away, but astronaut Ron McNair wrapped the robot arm around so the TV camera could capture the satellite's rocket burn on videotape. A bright flash later, and Palapa was on its way. Where to go, you guys? 
looking good. Uh, it'll just work. There is still no confirmation on whether it does work, whether the bird actually made it into the right orbit. That should be coming up sometime later on this hour. But now the crew can turn its attention to tomorrow's big moment, the big moment of the entire flight, in fact, the historic first jet-powered spacewalk. Today, Challenger's cabin pressure was reduced, and astronauts Bob Stewart and Bruce McCandless donned their space helmets to breathe pure oxygen. The helmets prompted this cry for help from outer space. The Martians are coming. The Martians are coming. It may be closer to the truth than they realize. Tomorrow, they'll don the entire spacesuit. Two of the astronauts going outside to don those Buck Rogers light jet backpacks to fly around without a tether in space, becoming, in effect, the first human satellites in orbit. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. CBS News, this is Dallas Townsend. The Indonesian communications satellite has now been declared lost in space. The launch itself appeared successful, but tracking personnel confirmed the satellite cannot be found in its expected orbit. President Palapa was the second satellite deployed by the 41B shuttle astronauts to be lost. As already reported, KTRH has been told by sources that a rocket on the Palapa has fired prematurely, and an early separation of the spacecraft and its payload assist module has occurred. The module is blamed for Friday's failed Westar 6 deployment. For six hours now, NORAD, NASA, and private industry have been searching for Palapa. Then, about an hour ago, this word from Mission Control. Hughes tracking personnel have confirmed that the Palampa satellite cannot be found in its expected orbit. There is a device called a telemetry package available for purchase on the payload assist modules that would allow ground controllers to get information from the module during deployment. Neither the Westar or Palapa owners chose to purchase that device. Thus, we will never really know what caused the two failures. NASA management is quite concerned about the events since there are some 75 of those modules scheduled to fly on the shuttle in the near future. Managers may not want that unit on the shuttle again until all of the problems are worked out. Live from the Johnson Space Center, this is Chris Peterson, KTRH News. CBS News, I'm Carol Kozowski. Challenger's current mission has run into one failure after another, but Chris Peterson reports tomorrow's tetherless spacewalk will be attempted on schedule. The second satellite launched by NASA on this space shuttle mission was lost today. Indonesia's Palapa satellite joins Western Union's Westar 6 spacecraft as permanent pieces of $75 million space junk in low Earth orbit. The makers of the satellites, Hughes Aircraft, say a faulty payload assist module designed to boost the satellites into higher orbits caused the failures. And Hughes Vice President Dick Brandis says both spacecraft are now totally useless. Well, apparently we don't know of any other mission that uh, it would be uh, useless that they can perform. NASA now faces a big question. It's scheduled to fly four more payload assist modules this year on the shuttle. If the modules are not working right, the danger of one of them exploding in the shuttle's payload bay may dictate the space agency not allow them to fly at all. That decision will be made after an intense investigation of the problem. The agency says the spacewalk set for tomorrow morning is still on. Astronauts Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart are set to fly those Buck Rogers jetpacks for the first time. The jetpacks are formerly known as manned maneuvering units, or MMUs. It's a self-contained backpack with nitrogen gas propulsion to allow shuttle crews to move around outside the confines of the payload bay. 
two hand controllers allow the astronauts wearing the pack to move about. The left hand controller will let the astronaut move forward and backward, left and right, or up and down. The right hand control allows him to spin, roll, and pitch in various directions. But this is not the first time a maneuvering unit has flown in space. Back on Skylab, the forerunner of the manned maneuvering unit, known as the M509, was tested inside the big orbital workshop. Mark Marietta built both the M509 and the MMUs now on the shuttle. Program manager Bill Bolandon says he's not even remotely concerned that the MMUs now on the shuttle will fail. One of the things we did learn on the M509 experiment was that the, that the unit itself flew very much like the simulations we had performed on the ground. Bolandon and the rest of the world will find out Tuesday just how reliable the simulators are. Astronauts McCandless and Stewart are scheduled to fly the backpacks for the first time around 7.15 in the morning. Live from the Johnson Space Center, this is Chris Peterson, KTRH News. Satellite, this is Mutual News. A government crew is awake now, getting ready for an historic spacewalk early Tuesday morning. For the first time, American astronauts will maneuver outside the spacecraft without a tether. They'll be using jet-propelled backpacks for the first time. <laughs> CBS News, this is Reed Collins. Mosler in a place in space history this morning. Bruce McCandless and Robert Stewart are getting ready to leave the shuttle Challenger in pressurized suits and sail away, powered by jetpack packs and without a lifeline tether. They're now in the shuttle airlock, McCandless known as EVA-1. Houston, this is uh, EVA-1. Are you reading over? Uh, Roger, Bruce. We're reading you loud and clear, homie. Uh, I should be sending Biomed now, and uh, Bob will be sending in a couple of seconds. You can ask him to check. All right, I'll copy that, Bruce. We got uh, good Biomed as you left the Argonne. The spacewalk, a five-hour procedure, is due to get underway about an hour and a half from now. The flight plan calls for an excursion as far as 100 yards from the ship. No strings. President Space suits are now zipped up. The astronauts are in the airlock, prepare pre-breathing pure oxygen, and a few feet away from them, on the other side of the airlock hatch, sit two Buck Rogers-style backpacks. About an hour from now, astronauts Buck, uh, Bob Stewart, that is, and Bruce McCandless will ease out of Challenger's airlock. Then they'll take turns donning one of the jet backpacks to fly up to a football field's length away from their spacecraft. It's a historic first here, astronauts flying without a safety line. NASA is hoping it will also be the first major event to go right with this flight. It was only this morning that capsule communicator John Blaha told the astronauts that their Palapa satellite was stuck in the wrong orbit, just like the worthless West Star. Everything that uh, the spaceship did and all the procedures that you did were absolutely correct, and uh, they were done uh, flawlessly, and... Uh, it blew our minds, too, and uh, we're having, as you can understand, a lot of engineering assessments still going on. That comment there is a reference to Commander Vance Brand's comment. He said that the uh, news about the Palapa satellite, quote, blew our minds. But now the crew has a chance to change Challenger's luck. And if it works, the crew will have tested a revolutionary new tool for use in space. KTRH's Chris Peterson explains how the two astronauts this morning will fly their manned maneuvering units. The man maneuvering unit is a totally self-contained backpack that allows astronauts wearing it to fly outside the shuttle's payload bay without a safety tether. That's important because on the next shuttle flight, the backpack will be used to fly out to a satellite in orbit, stabilize it, and bring it into the payload bay for repair. Flying the maneuvering unit is a relatively simple thing, according to those who have flown it in a simulator. The left-hand controller allows the astronaut to move forward and backward, left and right, or up and down. The right-hand controls spins and roll maneuvers. The MMU will be used today by astronaut Bruce McCandless first, then crewman Bob Stewart. Today's flight will be particularly meaningful to McCandless, who has been in on the development of the backpack almost from the beginning. From the Johnson Space Center, Chris Peterson, KTRH News. 514 on the morning report, and we'll keep you updated, of course, as uh, that big uh, spacewalk comes out this morning. Doug will be reporting on that throughout the morning report. CBS News, I'm Charles Osgood. Look, Ma, no tether. For the crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger, the moment of daring do is at hand. Jay Jones reports.
Bruce McCandless and Robert Stewart are now in the airlock aboard Challenger, suited up and ready to step out into space, into the open cargo bay. The astronauts have completed a new pre-breathe technique, breathing pure oxygen in short bursts to wash the nitrogen out of their bloodstreams and prevent onset of the bends, the crippling pain that divers can experience. First off, the two spacemen will check out their jet-powered backpacks. Then McCandless will disengage from the shuttle and try a little jetting around the cargo bay. Later, he plans to venture as far as 300 feet from Challenger with no lifeline attached to the mothership, the first man to venture into space on his own. The crew appears to be aching for a successful spacewalk to ease disappointment over the failure of their satellite payloads. The news of Palapa's misfiring, Commander Vance Brand said this morning, blew his mind. Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. McCandless and Bob Stewart have now taken on new identities. Their code names EV-1 and EV-2 for their extravehicular activity, the spacewalk. Uh, Houston, this is uh, EV-1. Are you reading? Over. Uh, Roger, Bruce. We're reading loud and clear. The two shuttle astronauts are now in the airlock, depressurizing that sealed off part of the shuttle before opening the outside hatch for their spacewalk. The only problem so far has been with the scratchy radio signals. When I'm floating free in the locker, I get a lot of static when I use my feet to wedge myself firmly and ground off this uh, AAP real good. Then the static goes away. Another odd problem has been cropping up for the past few minutes. Mysterious Morse code signals have been interfering with the shuttle's radio signals. So we see our driver receiving uh, Morse code. We're getting an in. Then we get a da 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 da. November, Yankee, Golf. And then a da da da. I don't remember what those two are. And they really don't know where those signals are coming from right now. It's no problem, though. They switch to a backup frequency. Any minute now, the two spacewalkers should step outside the hatch. And there, mounted in the Challenger's payload bay, are the new jet-powered backpacks that NASA hopes to test out on this flight. KTRH's Chris Peterson explains to us how those backpacks work. Hatch is now opening. Astronauts Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart are now about to step outside of the Challenger. Mission Control is watching through a television camera mounted on the shuttle's robot arm, watching the hatch open up right now. And the astronauts scheduled to crawl out just a couple of minutes from now. We'll keep you updated throughout the entire morning report with an update coming up just a few minutes from now. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. Yeah. And like any tourist, they're taking pictures in space. Already, uh, after having checked out the MMU once, McCandless says, says it looks good. The first part of this five-hour spacewalk is going well. We'll continue to follow it. Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. But for the astronauts McCandless and Stewart, weightless flight is according to plan. We're getting our first live pictures from Challenger, and there he is, Bruce McCandless. Backpack strapped on, the jets flashing as he practices movements up and down and left and right. Let's bring up some of the air to ground, see if you can hear them. Mission Control may come in in a moment, but Bruce has stopped talking and we've lost our signal. But all seems to be going well. There's Bruce now, let's listen. And of course, he stops talking as soon as we switch. Okay, Bruce. Now we also see Stewart over near the wall. Uh, back up A and uh, B, and then, uh, and of course, uh, Dan, you check the that for that. That's it. Jay Jones, CBS News from the Kennedy Space Center. are incredible. Just minutes ago, astronaut Bruce McCandless slipped on his jet-powered manned maneuvering unit and sailed out of Challenger's cargo bay. The first words of McCandless as he drifted away from the shuttle without a tether. Well, it may have been one small step for Neil, but it's a heck of a big lift for me. A 
A television camera mounted on Challenger's robot arm has been beaming back to Mission Control's Star Wars images so clear that ground controllers at times have seen the expression on the astronaut's face. And right now we're seeing a picture of McCandless flying with the Earth in the background and nothing else in the picture. It looks and sounds spectacular. How does it work? It works at the we sure have a nice flying machine here. Yeah, sir, Bruce, it looks uh, like a real friendly machine, real solid, real stable, and uh, looks like you did a good job with all that engineering work over those years. A big moment for Bruce McCandless. He's the man who helped build the backpack. He's now flying around the Challenger. This is the first major part of this space shuttle mission that's gone right. As KTRH's Chris Peterson explains, it's going to take a lot of this kind of euphoria to wipe away the anxiety from the mechanical snafu that sent two satellites into the wrong orbits. Two unsuccessful satellite deployments on this shuttle mission, both using the same equipment. What does that mean to the space shuttle program? NASA is scheduled to fly four more of the payload assist modules held responsible for the two failed launches this year alone, with 27 more ready to fly by 1988. What if the malfunctions that prevented the Westar and Palapa satellites from reaching orbit happened earlier than they did, say when the spacecraft were still in the shuttle's cargo bay? NASA's thinking quite long and hard about that. Shuttle manager Glenn Lunny said Monday NASA would conduct an intensive investigation of the two failed launches, and he said the space agency would sure be a whole lot more comfortable knowing the payload assist modules are healthy. But that may be difficult, since little data on either deployment was obtained. Either way, Lunny says it will be some time before NASA will have to make a decision. The next satellite launch on the shuttle using a PAM is set for June. From the Johnson Space Center, Chris Peterson, KTRH News. All the presidents... He... CBS News, I'm Charles Osgood. Alone in space, the jubilation of astronaut Bruce McCandless. For the first time ever, an astronaut on a spacewalk unattached to the mothership. Jay Jones is with us at the Kennedy Space Center. Jay, what's happening right now? Well, Bruce McCandless is coming back to the payload bay. He said earlier, this is a nice flying machine. Of course, he may be biased. He's been working on its design for years. He seems right on the mark, though. McCandless and his space pack have been smoothly moving in space. First, there were slow, tentative ups and downs in the cargo bay. And he said, I think I'll leave. And out he went, crossing around the Challenger, jetting out first to 150 feet from the shuttle, and then to 320 feet. As you said, the first man to be an Earth-orbiting satellite all by himself, 150 nautical miles above the Earth. At the time, it was Florida and the Cape below. McCandless said he could see both perfectly. He's been enjoying the view and the fun of backpacking around in space. He'll be back in the bay shortly to practice some docking maneuvers while Robert Stewart prepares to take his ride outside. This is Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. Historic first for the space shuttle, astronaut Bruce McCandless is now the first man to walk in space without a safety line. All he has is the jet-powered man maneuvering unit, and that's all he seems to need. Is this the Mr. Jones coming over? Sure is. Beautiful down there. He's been saying that over and over again. Beautiful, neat adjectives seem to defy him. Flying a football field's distance away from the Challenger, McCandless offered to smile for the gang back on the shuttle. The pictures have been so good that they've been able to see his face. They, along with Mission Control, are watching TV pictures of McCandless zipping around the shuttle, laughing as he flies along, a separate human satellite. Still ahead, a docking with a simulated satellite and a cherry picker style ride on Challenger's robot arm. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. Like armchairs without a place to sit. There is a backboard against which the astronaut places his back and which has armrests extending from it. At the end of each armrest, there is a control lever in the shape of a T. By twisting, pushing, and pulling the left lever, the astronaut can propel himself up, down, forward, back, and left, right. Using the right lever, the astronaut can spin like a top, revolve like a pinwheel, or tumble head over heels. Small jets on the suits allow the astronauts to move slowly through space in case anything was to go wrong on one of these walks. The other crew members inside the space shuttle could scoop up the lost spacewalker using the cargo bay. Next on. 
This is Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. Bruce McCandless has done what no man has ever done before. He's traveled in space by himself, outside a spaceship. The astronaut moved some 320 feet away from Challenger using his jet-powered backpack. Jack Post, Ed, what's it do? You sure have a nice flying machine here. Yes, sir, Bruce. It looks uh, like a real friendly machine, real solid, real stable, and uh, looks like you did a good job with all that engineering work over those years. McCandless positioned himself out there, enjoying the view, Florida and Cape Canaveral below, the spreading Earth, the dark sky above, while the three astronauts inside Challenger watched, as they said, enviously. You may get the, uh, the name of the world's fastest human being uh, going along there at four miles a second, Bruce. Exactly what well, he's doing, I guess, for the next hour or so. And what he meant by that the next hour or so was the turn of Robert Stewart, who has been patiently waiting in the cargo bay, attending to some less glamorous tasks. He's been preparing the Space Age work platform, which will be attached to the remote manipulator arm, like a cherry picker, to repair disabled satellites on future missions. Right now, Stewart is putting on his backpack, and he's communicating with mission control. Let's see what he's saying. Now he's quiet. He's putting on the backpack. The backpack that was taken off by Bruce McCandless. And then Stewart will take his turn and go out to 150, maybe 300 feet. McCandless actually went out to 320. Robert Stewart. There he is. They're talking to Bob now. He's ready to leave the cargo bay. Shuttle Flight 41B is having a successful spacewalk. More than two hours to go. Jay Jones, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. This is Jay Jones, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. The Challenger spacewalk is in its final phase. Astronaut Robert Stewart has the jet-powered backpack on now. He moved out of the cargo bay, then moved out to more than 300 feet. Stewart is a helicopter pilot, so he should be used to this kind of movement, up and down, back and forward. He's running a little behind his timeline, so he's not doing two separate uh, EVAs out to the maximum position as McCandless did. He's also much quieter than McCandless. Stewart is not as making as many comments. Uh, McCandless had to remind him at one point, don't forget to take pictures. Stewart following the trail blazed by Bruce McCandless today. McCandless jetted out into space to about 320 feet from Challenger, moving smoothly and without effort. And now Robert Stewart goes down as the second human satellite. The astronauts have had a successful EVA, extravehicular activity, two spacewalks. They've been rehearsing and testing the backpack for a satellite repair mission. The next shuttle flight, in less than a month, will feature a try at bringing to life the dead Solar Max satellite, the Solar Maximum Mission Observatory. Launched about four years ago to study sunspots and solar flares, Solar Max went dead ten weeks later. And the next Challenger crew will attempt to dock with that disabled satellite and fix it. The Shuttle 41B mission completing a pair of successful spacewalks. Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. That feeling you get in the pit of your stomach on a roller coaster ride must be nothing compared to the thrill of NASA's astronauts today. They're floating free in space. I'm Mary Margaret Myers, and ABC's Vic Ratner is at the Kennedy Space Center. Astronaut Bruce McCandless became the world's first human satellite and perhaps the fastest man in space, flying at 17,000 miles an hour, hovering above the shuttle in his rocket-powered backpack. McCandless had worked over 10 years on this project and reported to astronaut Jerry Ross on the ground, this is neat. Correct, Pastor Ed, what's it do? You sure have a nice flying machine here. Yes, sir, Bruce. It looks uh, like a real friendly machine, real solid, real stable, and uh, looks like you did a good job with all that engineering work over those years. McCandless and fellow astronaut Bob Stewart are testing the equipment and techniques to be used to repair disabled satellites. Vic Ratner, ABC News at the Kennedy Space Center. More news coming up. Coming up. 
Weather has been out of range of ground tracking stations for the past couple of minutes, but if all is going according to schedule, their Buck Rogers backpack has been stowed away back into its place in the shuttle's cargo bay. Now both of the astronauts have had a chance to ride on a special work platform mounted on the end of the shuttle's arm. Bruce McCandless thinks it makes a great place to work. There's a lot of envious people watching you. Uh, looks like you're having a lot of fun up there. Well, it's uh, working very nicely. <laughs> They're going to try to fix one of the uh, shuttle's pallet satellites before they walk back inside, at least one of the experiments on the sh shuttle pallet satellite, the SPAS as they call it. And they're also going to try to grab one of the television cameras that is broadcasting black and white pictures instead of color pictures. This in part to appease some of the network television people who are complaining about the problem. Anyway, they'll grab the camera and take it inside and try to switch it out with another color camera that's working properly. The spacewalk continues. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. Okay. CBS News, I'm Douglas Edwards. Space is now history. The first men to float free in space, unattached to their craft, are now back, safe and sound. Jay Jones is keeping tabs at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Astronauts Bruce McCandless and Robert Stewart are stowing their gear away after two thrilling spacewalks. McCandless was bubbling as he jetted out to 320 feet from the Challenger spacecraft, praising the view and calling his nitrogen gas-powered backpack a nice flying machine. Later in the cargo bay, when Stewart was putting on the backpack, the experienced McCandless gave him some advice. Just remember one thing, one false move and flop. But Stewart made no false moves. Although he did get tangled up in a tether before he left the cargo bay, Stewart backpacked to a little over 300 feet out in space, maneuvering easily. The Army helicopter pilot saying it's a piece of cake. McCandless and Stewart, the world's first human satellites. Jay Jones, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. These first human satellites are now in what will be the last minutes of their history-making spacewalk. And what a trip it's been this morning. Astronauts Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart taking turns flying out one of the Challenger's car, one by one out of the Challenger's cargo bay, traveling up to 320 feet away from the shuttle without a tether, using only the jet-bowered backpack. Now McCandless is perched at a workstation mounted at the end of the shuttle's robot arm, the arm swinging him around the payload bay as he simulates the work necessary to fix a satellite on the next shuttle flight. Wobbles a little bit, but it's uh, pretty useful as a work platform. They're running late as they wrap up their first spacewalk, but neither of the astronauts seem to mind. And even if they don't get their fill of flying and swinging around in space today, they'll get another chance on a second spacewalk scheduled for Thursday. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. Yeah. CBS News, this is Doug Poling. In space today, two American astronauts, Bruce McCandless and Robert Stewart, became the first humans to fly free in space using jet-powered backpacks. In separate flights, the two men ventured a little more than 300 feet away from the shuttle Challenger before returning safely. The Congressional Budget Office says the huge... Comic book fantasy has now become a reality. We sure have a nice flying machine here. Flying a football field's distance away from the space shuttle, astronaut Bruce McCandless beamed back Star Wars-style images of himself slowly rising away from the shuttle. The pictures from the robot arm so clear that the crew inside Challenger could see the smile on his face. A lot of envious people watching you. Uh, looks like you're having a lot of fun up there. Uh, McCandless spent 90 minutes flying the backpack he helped design. Stewart, roughly an hour. Oh, you can feel the thrusters banging a little bit here. Is this Earth coming over? Sure is. Boy, it's beautiful down here. And both of them got a chance to ride on a special work platform mounted at the end of the shuttle's robot arm. Just remember one thing. One foot move and flap. All of this a test for the satellite repair job slated for the next shuttle flight. The only big problem, if you can call it that, Bob Stewart had trouble slipping into some slots cut out for his boots. Certainly nothing to dampen the euphoria of this moment, and certainly nothing to prevent another jet-powered spacewalk day after tomorrow. The astronauts about to crawl back into the Challenger, ending this spacewalk. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Doug Miller, KTRH News. 
communications satellites they launched. This was a good day. Astronauts Bruce McCandless and Robert Stewart made history by flying free in space. They used a gas-powered jetpack to propel them more than 300 feet from the shuttle and back again. It worked fine. Two failed satellites launched from the payload bay and a faulty balloon deployment for use as a rendezvous target had put the damper on the spirit of the shuttle crew. But this morning, mission specialist Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart made an historic walk in space, highlighted by the first flight of the man maneuvering backpacks. The spacewalk drew some envious comments from Commander Vance Brand. A lot of envious people watching you. Uh, looks like you're having a lot of fun up there. Well, it's uh, working very nicely. Both astronauts, Bob Stewart and McCandless, flew more than 300 feet out of the payload bay on the backpacks with no safety lines attached. They also planted themselves on a platform at the end of the 50-foot arm to be pitched around by Ron McNair on Challenger's flight deck. It was all a drill for the next shuttle flight, which will try to repair the ailing solar maximum satellite now in orbit. From the Johnson Space Center, Chris Peterson, KTRH News. <laughs> CBS News, this is Paul Lockwood. With the two faulty communication satellites, space agency officials were all smiles today after the highly successful escapades of Challenger astronauts Bruce McCatless and Robert Stewart. Decked out in their Buck Rogers style jetpacks, the two men walked free in outer space, the first time that man has done that without a lifeline or tether affixed to the spacecraft. On your Tuesday, at the Kennedy Space Center, ABC's Vic Ratner tells us what was learned from the day's experiments. We learned that the rocket-propelled backpack, which astronauts will use to get over to disabled spacecraft, works, and we learned that the special tools, which the astronauts will use on the next shuttle flight to fix a disabled satellite, also work. One other thing, we learned that floating in space can be fun. And another cordless walk in space is set for Thursday. That backpack used by astronauts McCandless and Stewart has a price tag of $10 million. But the Marines prepare to withdraw from Beirut as the battleship New Jersey shells the interior. Bipartisan talks today on paring down the deficit. Good morning, this is Reed Collins with the CBS World News Roundup. CBS News, this is Mitchell Krause. The astronauts of the Challenger Space Shuttle now have company in orbit, as Mission Control was quick to announce. You guys have got some company up there this morning. The Soviets launched at 6.08 a.m. They're going up to rendezvous with the Soviet. And for your information, that makes an all-time record having eight folks in space at one time. Oh, great. It's really getting to be populated up there. With details of the Soviet launch, Mark Phillips in Moscow. In announcing the launch today, the Soviet news agency TASS said that all systems aboard the Soyuz 10 spacecraft were functioning normally and that the three cosmonauts were well. Although advanced details of the flight are sketchy, the Soviets did say it's planned the Soyuz spacecraft will link up with the Salyut 7 space station and perform scientific, technical, medical, and biological experiments. One of the three cosmonauts, Colonel Leonid Kizim, has been in space before in 1980. No details were provided on the duration of the mission. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Moscow. The Challenger commander, Vance Brand, has been in space with Russians before. He was a member of the crew when the Apollo-Soyuz link-up in space took place in July 1975. As for today's Challenger schedule, it's mostly preparation for another spacewalk tomorrow and a careful review of weather conditions at Cape Canaveral to determine if the Saturday return to Earth can go as planned. More CBS News in a moment. News, I'm Douglas Edwards. Good day. CBS News, I'm Douglas Edwards. More than enough, it's a record. There are eight people circling the globe today. The five Americans aboard the space shuttle Challenger and the three cosmonauts who blasted off several hours ago for a rendezvous with the Soviet Salyut 7 space station. When told of his new neighbors in orbit, shuttle commander Brand said it's really getting to be populated up here. Now this. crew basically did what they wanted today. After the much talked about spacewalk Tuesday, Mission Control gave them the day off to rest up for another six hours of spacewalking Thursday. 
The five men reported to Mission Control they were all in good shape and feeling well this morning. And Mission Control had some news for them, too. And for your information, you guys have got some company up there this morning. The Soviets launched at 6.08 a.m. They're going up to rendezvous with the Salyut. NORAD says the Salyut 7 space station will come no closer to Challenger than 260 miles, so neither spacecraft will see the other. Early tomorrow morning, mission specialist Bruce McCandless and Bob Stewart will suit up again for more maneuvers with those jet-propelled backpacks. Chris Peterson, KTRH News, live at the Johnson Space Center. I'm Carol Fazetsky. NASA says that investigators studying pairs of rocket motors on both satellites launched by the shuttle Challenger have impounded parts made in the same lots with the motors. Satellite launchings on future shuttle missions are uncertain because of the problem. The rocket motors are made by McDonnell Douglas. Challenger astronauts McCandless and Stewart refueled their $10 million backpacks preparing for a second walk in space tomorrow. They and their three fellow crew members are not the only humans orbiting the Earth. The Soviet Union launched a Soyuz spacecraft carrying three cosmonauts to the Soviet 7 space station. Vance Brand, commander of the Challenger, heard the news and said, That's great. It's really getting populated up here. More news after this. The crew had an easy day Wednesday, getting very little thrown at them by ground controllers in mission control. They were resting after Tuesday's successful flight of those manned maneuvering unit backpacks and in anticipation of doing it all again Thursday. Mission Control did tell the crew they had company up in space. The Russians launched three men early Wednesday en route to their orbiting Salyut space station. Commander Vance Brand said it was getting rather crowded up there. NORAD tracking says neither spacecraft will see each other, coming only 260 miles apart at their closest passing. Otherwise, it's all systems go for the six-hour stroll in space Thursday. The highlight again will be mission specialists McCandless and Stewart flying the maneuvering units. Both of them will attempt to dock with a spinning shuttle pallet satellite on the end of the mechanical arm 50 feet overhead. That may sound difficult, but Bill Bolandonk of Martin Marietta is the program manager responsible for building the backpacks. He says Thursday's docking attempts have been well rehearsed on the ground. We do have a, a six degree of freedom simulator, what we call a moving base simulator. And that simulator tied with computers uh, to a timeline allows us to fly the MMU, albeit in a uh, 1G environment, essentially the same way as we will fly it in space. Thursday's activity is all part of the dress rehearsal for April's shuttle mission. It's scheduled to rendezvous, repair, and restore to orbit the failing solar maximum satellite, now 275 miles up in orbit. The maneuvering units will be the key to the success of that flight, and with a $45 million price tag on the units now in space, they have a good chance to return 10 times their investment by fixing the ailing $400 million solar max. Chris Peterson, KTRH News at the Johnson Space Center. It takes a lot more than gasoline to fuel the space shuttle, but for those of us back here on Earth, gas is a precious commodity.